3,000 leagues to the west, across the Earth Ocean, lies the imperial nation of the Shanchen, with widespread slavery, constant warfare, and a deep apathy for all Aes Sedai. Under the Empress, who is believed to be the direct descendant of Arthur Hawkwing himself, a storm amasses. As stories of the Dragon Reborn spread across the Westlands, something sinister sails across the sea. The first small wave of 500 ships touch down to avenge the death of Arthur Hawkwing. This is The Road to Tarvalin, and today we're talking about the Shanchen. I think we can start out with Arthur Hawkwing because that's kind of where the story begins. So Arthur Hawkwing, pretty fearless general, nobility. A prince. A prince. He was a prince. Mm -hmm. He brings a false dragon to Tarvalin and a little snafu happens. You're not allowed to bring military to Tarvalin. Basically, this begins a very tumultuous relationship between Arthur Hawkwing and the White Tower. The thing that I've always thought about with Arthur Hawkwing is like a connection with King Arthur, but I started thinking about him more as like Alexander the Great, who Mm -hmm. is another famous commanding general known Mm -hmm. in our history. Like he just united everything under himself. So when he entered Tarvalin, was he under the impression that like he could do this because he'd united the rest of the Westlands under him? History is divided on whether or not the Aes Sedai accompanying Arthur Hawkwing gave him permission to enter Tarvalin with this false dragon in tow. If it was the White Towers, oopsie, they wouldn't say that it was their fault. You're but right. I don't believe that he would ever say that it was his fault either. So You're right. The amount of information available on him is like super minimal. So there really isn't a way to parse out the contradicting stories that were yeah. taking place. <laughs> yes. Sometimes it's maybe forgotten just how tumultuous his relationship with Tarvalin was. Then when you fast forward to the descendants of Arthur Hawkwing, these views, I would say, Mm -hmm. may have carried on to a new nation. The views of mistrust of the White Tower and women who can channel? Yes. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. So Arthur Hawkwing has a son, Luther Payendrag, Mm -hmm. and he takes this great big expedition, I think a thousand ships, hundreds of thousands of men, and he sails west across the Earth Ocean. And he lands on a place called Shanchen. And at the time, there were Aes Sedai in Shanchen, but they were kind of like free agent Aes Sedai. Mm-hmm. And this continent was always warring, always fighting. And you could kind of say that Luther Pendrag followed in the footsteps of his father and kind of like consolidates this nation. And from this point on, it becomes an imperial nation where all nobility comes from the line of Arthur Hawkwing himself. So Mm -hmm. they say, this is why they call themselves the blood. They're of the noble blood of Arthur Hawkwing. The interesting thing that has happened here is that, again, Alexander the Great, Arthur Hawkwing, the moment they die, their empire is gone. There was no one of strength enough to hold it all together. So Luther goes across the ocean. He, as you said, follows in his father's footsteps, creates his own empire, but he manages to kind of keep it all on a lockdown. And what becomes known as the Shanchen, they're that way for a very long time. It makes what happens with them later on even more of almost a fairy tale in a way that like they made it they were successful they're coming back yeah would you call it a caste system oh what a good question because you can only be born into the blood and then if you are anything below that you're either a commoner or a slave at the very bottom you have the daco veil and -hmm. these are the slaves those who are property if you're a woman that can channel, you are Daco Vale. You become property. You are nothing more than 
a cow to be sold like at a market. Like every once in a while, it gets referenced how they're treated like dogs and occasionally fondly like dogs. And then above that, just slightly above being a slave are the commoners and the merchants. Okay. And then slightly above that is the sojin. And those are the upper class slaves. So if you are a slave of nobility, you have a higher ranking than a merchant even. It makes things really strange to think about because we're talking about people who would welcome slavery Mm -hmm. because it puts them at a higher place than Mm -hmm. others, which Mm -hmm. is just mind boggling to think Mm -hmm. about. There's even a saying Mm -hmm. and it says the loss of freedom, even for future generations, is believed a very small price for advancement. We're talking about people who are like walking into this willingly. And then above these slaves of nobility are the nobility of the blood. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. there's just pretty much like four spots. And then, of course, kind of on the side, you have the Shanchen military where If you've worked your way up the ranks, then you have a higher position than you would as maybe a merchant or commoner, because Mm -hmm. it might be seen as a way of getting out of this system. In a society like the one that the Shanchen develops, there is a reverence surrounding the nobility that's very different from pretty Mm -hmm. much anything else we see in the Westlands. Like, when they say things like the Empress, may she live forever, they mean it. Like they don't mm-hmm. want like a collapse. And at the same time, you have the descendants to the throne killing each other to be the top of the top to get to the top. In Shan Chen, there is this layer of scheming between the royal family oh, where yeah. sisters killing sisters. And when you look at how these people go out into the world and just communicate with each other. This gets even more strange because as far as where your ranking is, you can't even make eye contact with someone who's above you. And let alone if you're someone like the empress herself, if you're at the very top, everyone is below Mm -hmm. you. So no one can look you in the eyes. And on top of that, it would be improper to speak to anyone lower than yourself. So she employs someone who is her speaker, where Mm -hmm. she'll send like subtle gestures to this person who can't even look her in the eyes. Mm -hmm. And this person will speak for her. I don't know. I, and maybe it's just having a Western culture upbringing. Yeah, like the idea of being like, oh, I get to be like involved in a royal household, sure. Me and my children and my children's children and my children's 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 children. Do you think a Kyrianin or a Shanchen would play Desdemar better? I think the Shanchen would just have you outright murdered. Some of the the nobles that we meet of the Shanchen have an unsettling knowledge of poisons and how to use deadly weapons and It's interesting. Maybe that's how they've kept power for a thousand years. They are completely cut off. They're on their own continent. So they don't have outside ideals coming over to their nation and changing the line of thought. Oh, yes. (laughs) But I have so many like things like kicking off in the back of my head. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So I want to talk a little bit about their warfare since we're already talking about (laughs) poisons and assassinations. And I would say their greatest weapon is the IDOM. And this is a weapon that was made by an Aes Sedai seeking favor with Luther Pandrag. So we have an Aes Sedai who willingly created a device that enslaves female channelers. And despite her trying to win favor with Luther Pandrag, she was not rewarded for this good deed. For her trouble, Diane was rewarded with imprisonment from her own device. She was, after all, Aes Sedai and thus not to be trusted. It was said her screams shook the towers of midnight. And what a quote, because 
not only are we seeing how low Luther Pendrag believed Aes Sedai are, we have a book, Towers of Midnight, but these are actually like obsidian structures in Shan Chen. And the item is employed by the Shan Chen military. So if you are born and you are someone who can touch the source without needing to be trained, Mm-hmm. You're collared mm-hmm. and you are then a part of the military where they use channeling as a weapon or as the I said, I take the three oaths. They can't. It feels to me as though they are much more active in seeking these women out than the I said, I ever are. Regardless, they just drag you away. Moving forward. Moving on. So if we keep going and talking about some of their weapons and how their military works. I would have to also like bring in the fact that they employ these beasts from other worlds Mm -hmm. as part of their military strength. If you've made it through, I want to say about halfway ish through the great hunt, you will have already come across Mm -hmm. one of Mm -hmm. these creatures. Yep. Okay. So you have someone called a Morat. And this person would be like a trainer or a handler. So these are animals and they are all really strange. But you have something called like a torm, which is a horse sized cat reptile. And then there's a corm, and then there's a lopar, and then there's a grom and a rockin and a toe rockin. I, I kind <laughs> of want a lopar. <laughs> Don't we all want a lopar? <laughs> I mean, it was a good lopar. <laughs> The Rockin' and Toe Rockin', probably one of the cooler creatures within the Wheel of Time. Heck yeah, they are. Where the Rockin' is like the smaller version, but think like very Jurassic Park. The pterodactyls? Is that right? Mm-hmm. Are those the flying? It's, yeah, it's like similar to a pterodactyl kind of, but mm-hmm. the Toe Rockin', it's so big that it can't just like get up and fly. Like it has mm-hmm. to run for <laughs> Like 900 paces or something, and then it can lift <laughs> off and it can't even stand upright. So it kind of like walks on all fours and its back is supposedly like nine feet tall. So like 2.7 meters. So they're just massive. Then they have the smaller version, the rockin, which we see people flying around on. Mm -hmm. And it's really funny to think of, but (laughs) within the context of the book, it works because Mm -hmm. we don't have anyone else that can fly in the Westlands. Okay. So the next really interesting part of their military, I guess, would be the Death Watch Guard. They are basically the protectors of the Imperial line. Mm -hmm. So these are fighters who are the most fierce, the best at killing, the best at protecting, Mm -hmm. and they will fight to the death gladly. Mm -hmm. They have no fear of it. And they would definitely rather die than harm come to the person they are protecting. Yeah. And they're not human, all of them, which is awesome. That's true. Kind of forgotten about that. When we go through the first couple books of The Wheel of Time, we meet Loyal, who's Mm -hmm. your friendly neighborhood (laughs) Ogier. And then... On the flip side of this, we have the Ogier Gardeners, which Mm -hmm. are Ogier warriors. The Ogier Gardeners have a totally different mindset, and we're not really sure how this difference came between the Ogier in the Westlands versus the Ogier on Shanchen. Mm -hmm. But there are theories saying how since the breaking of the world didn't really affect Shan Chen mm-hmm. like it did in the Westlands, the Ogier had many groves in Shan Chen, which would be a very coveted resource if you're a nation that despises female channelers, mm. because this is like area where they can't protect themselves. Maybe it's stemming from like a militarization of settings. Mm-hmm. Oh, man, I'm can thinking... you imagine how badass you'd be after like 
hundreds of years because they live such long lives. Right. And I'm thinking too, perhaps it is because in the Westlands, Ogier are kind of cut off from society. They can't Mm. leave their steadings for too long. Mm -hmm. Otherwise the longing comes and they Mm -hmm. can't live with that. That makes them very ill. Yeah. If you're in a society like Shan Chen, where there are steadings everywhere, you can travel everywhere and you're not cut off from the culture of these people. So maybe they've just integrated themselves more into this nationalistic imperial warrior system. They become assimilated to the violence. Right, right. Yeah. Or not even to the violence, but just assimilating into the culture. The violence is a part of the culture. That, that's what I mean. I would think that you would develop this strong of a military, this fierce of a military to make sure that the blood remains the blood. It's probably assimilate to that or don't be part of the culture at all. I would like to know with for anyone who's watched up to the end of season one i would like to know an impression of our first glimpse of the women who can channel like i want to know how people thought when they saw them i want to know what people think about the armor up on top we have some of the men with their full faces covered it's not so much insect like Mm -hmm. but it is terrifying (laughs) It really is. Yeah. 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 Are you hopeful for anything in season two of the Wheel of Time? Well, yeah. One of my favorite parts of the military for the Shanjen is their Navy. But I want to see them use their Navy in a way that's going to be brutal and unexpected and fairly hard to defend for the majority of the people that they come in contact with. I want more of the inner workings. Like I want to see them talking on the ship. I want to know what their battle plans are. Mm -hmm. And at the very least, I want to see some weird creatures. I want to see some toe rocking flying around. (laughs) I would love to see one of the ship's being boarded and see the reaction to the armor style and the differences that come along because it's not even just that they're under attack it's that they're under attack by what humanoids who like have these really wacky insect-like armor to it like I love 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 the descriptions of the armor it sounds protective light and flexible and that's like an exoskeleton. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like they definitely come across as being invincible. I hope it's a focus. I hope it's not just something that they touch on. Like I'm here for more. <laughs> so am I. Like yeah. they're coming back for something that they believe belongs to them. I mean, that's why when the first touch comes over, it's just a touch. It's not like an invading army. Minuscule. They're like, nope, just tell everyone. The armies of Archer Hawkwing are back. 